The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Amazing hacks, inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem, and today we are rebuilding one of my oldest projects, the Synthesizer Wristwatch. This basically was an Atari Punk console and a light pheromin mixed into being a wristwatch. And it sounds annoying as it gets. But it never really satisfied me. First, because it broke at a Maker Fair where I brought this. But the other thing is, you have to play it live. You can't do it like a DJ where there is a pre-recorded sound and you're altering it to give it new values and new sounds. Today I want to build a wrist mounted synthesizer. It should have a lot of buttons and switches and it should be programmable. So I can use all these buttons and switches to set a specific melody and then play that back. And while playing it back I also want to be able to alter the pitch, the speed and the pattern. So I can use it like a DJ to annoy people better than ever before. The original Synthwatch wasn't a self-contained unit. You needed an additional cable to power it. And this time, of course, I want to build a self-contained unit. Let's look at all the parts that we need. To make the unit programmable, of course, we need a microcontroller. My first intention was to use the Arduino Micro, but then I realized I need to have an additional charge controller for the LiPo battery. So I switched over to the Arduino MKR, which already has that functionality built in. Wi-Fi comes as a bonus. Key difference, the Arduino Micro likes 5 volts on this pin, this one only likes 3.3 volts, so keep that in mind when you construct your project. For the interface I use a push button, a lot of tiny switches and slider potentiometers. These are really awesome. And I also need an IC. This is a 74HC165, which is a shift register that allows me to map a lot of inputs to one serial output, so I won't use as many pins on the Arduino but I can still map eight inputs, in this case my switches, to one serial output for the Arduino. And if I wanted to, I could gang them up in series and use multiples of eight switches. So eight, 16, 32, 64, whatever you would want. Here's a project tip for you. If you want to build your own macro keyboard or your own dedicated controller for your favorite software or game, you can use these shift registers in conjunction with an Arduino Micro to build your own human interface device. Leave it in the comments if you would like to see such a project on this channel. We can construct such a project in two ways. First, build a PCB, solder all the components onto that and build a case around it. Or do it the other way, build a case, mount all the parts into that and use freehand wiring to build our circuit. This time I want to use the second method so I construct a faceplate that I can mount all my inputs to and I use this schematic to be able to determine where everything should go. You can download that schematic for free at element14.com forward slash presents. And when I have that, I will solder all my components to that according to my schematic. I used Fusion 360 to construct my design, but before I would laser cut and 3D print that in the real material, I use cheaper plywood to make a jig so I can see if all the parts would align. And I'm also using these plywood jigs after that when I cut the real piece to hold everything in place to make it easier to assemble. The interface parts are sandwiched in between my wooden jig and the real plastic faceplate that was laser cut from PMMA. So I can conveniently hold them all in place and have it easier while soldering. 
I had to cut the faceplate multiple times to get it right and some of them got cracks in them. You can fill that up with very thin super glue that gives it back its rigidity. And then I ran out of PMMA material, so I had to use one of the cracked faceplates. But that only gives it character, right? The device is constructed with two PMMA sheets as the front and back and a 3D printed rim in the middle. I had to reprint that a few times because I needed to get the position for all the inputs and outputs for the headphone jack and also for the USB mount correct. And also I wanted to give it a little more breathing room so I made it a little bit thicker than I originally planned. Now it's time to test out all these inputs so I made some test sketches so I can see if the inputs are mapped correctly, if the analog values uh, get mapped to the outputs. I use the serial terminal to watch that. And then I'm ready to start with the real code. Okay, truth be told, I broke the 3D printed button, so that's stuck. And I don't want to do it all over again. So I need to find a solution to do in code to make it programmable without having to push the button after a set. So I need to have like an audible interface. Let's start with the code. This is my SynthWatch X standalone code. First we have to declare some pins. We need an analog pin to read the potentiometer for the pitch. We need another one for the delay. The delay is the time between two notes. You can also call that speed or the length of the note. Then there's the programming pin. This is a toggle switch that triggers the programming mode or the playback mode. And that's the OK pin that I broke. So we are not using that anymore. Then we have the output pin. That is the one that outputs the sound signal to an amplifier and also to the speaker or the headphones, whatever you would like to use. Then we need some pins to interface the shift a register, serial output, SHLD is serial load, uh, parallel load or serial output. So if you put that high, it changes the state. And we have a clock signal for the shift register. A lot of variables for all the stuff that we want to do. We have these lists or arrays for the pattern. So it has a pattern for the switch states. It also has the same for the pitches that we program and also for the delays that we program. So every note that is played consists of a switch state, a pitch and a delay. We declare all these pins and this tone function gives us a ready signal, so it will play these three notes and we know, okay, everything has booted up. After that, it will check if it's in the programming state. If that is true, it will read the shift register with this piece of code, these four loops over and over, so it gets all the inputs. And when it has them, it will write it to parallel data and store these parallel data in the respective variables. And then it will read all the pitches that we set. So we get into a for loop, read our potentiometers and give us that tone. If we stay on the tone for three seconds, it will then read it again, map it to a usable range and save it to that range. And that is confirmed with a double beep. This is just for serial debugging. And when all the iterations are finished, so eight tones are programmed, it will beep three times. So you know, okay, everything is set. Then it will check again if the programming pin is still in programming mode. If that is true, you can set a new pattern. If anywhere in a point around this part of the program you have changed that pin, it will go to the playback mode. The playback mode also reads the shift registers again 
and it also reads the analog potentiometers and give it the function live pitch and live delay. So when you play that back, it first checks if that pattern means that this node is active. It checks for a 48 because 48 is a zero in ASCII and we save these values as strings. So they are looking for the exact representation and not the number zero. They look for a zero symbol. So it's 48, 49 would be one. If that tone is in there, we will use the pitch that we have set and add the live pitch that we can dynamically do. It also will set the delay and add the live delay to it and then it will do this tone. And if the pattern says this sound is inactive, it will only do the delay. You could set default values in the code for all these variables to have a set melody when you boot up the device. But I haven't done that because I want to take advantage of a property that old microcomputers and microcontrollers have. If you just turn them on, some pins can be in weird states and determine the variables. So if I turn on this device and haven't set any pattern, it has a pattern at random and I can use that. So if I don't want to program a pattern, I can just randomly generate one with that property. Let's try out this crazy annoying synthesizer wristwatch. I'm recording the sound directly by putting the sound output directly into the microphone input of my camera. I'm not a synthesizer musician, so please expect just some annoying sounds. Enjoy! synthesizer wristwatch turned out a bit more bulky than I expected and also my mounting solution is not the best one. But it's also more fun than I expected and the programming is really easy with the audio interface. So it's pretty intuitive and it's a lot of fun to play around with the sounds once programmed. If I would make this project again I would build more than one unit, like two or three of them, and take advantage of the Wi-Fi functionality. So people could make collaborative music and annoy each other. I gotta go. There's somebody I want to drive mad with this thing. And then another project is waiting for me. Yeah.